This evening we are going to try to draw together many of the threads and elements of religious ritualism as these converge in the early religious rites of Christianity. First of all, there is a broad point which we have to more or less consider. And that is the magical or metaphysical element in the celebration of religious rites. Such an element has always been assumed to exist. And to a very great degree, religion as religious ceremony has developed around this central core of a mystical or magical transformation of substances, materials, and conditions by religious means. I think we have to go back a, a long way to find the very beginnings of this religious magic. I know, for example, uh, in Southwest uh, United States, the uh, Kachina dancers of the uh, Navajo and Hopi people have a ritual that in a strange way summarizes the entire mystery of religious magic. In their various rites and ceremonies, most of the Kachina dancers are masked. The masks are very simple homemade productions, as you might imagine, usually fashioned from the skin of animals, painted, adorned with fur, feathers, and even various vegetable and plant structures. In the uh, ritual of these people, the mask must be painted behind the back of the artist. He must not see it until it is finished. This, of course, accounts for a certain crudeness, but at the same time it am is amazing uh, how uh, well the designs can be perfected even in this way. Once the mask has been completed, the artist, who is all probability, in all probability is also going to be the wearer, may look upon it safely. If he looks upon it before it is finished, he will be stricken blind according to the belief of his people. After the mask is finished, he must wear it only at the most sacred ceremonies. He is not permitted to put it on. Uh, except during the ritual itself. He cannot pose for it, uh, pose with it for a picture or anything of that nature. It must never be on his head except in the actual ceremony. Actually also, according to his belief, when he wears this mask as part of an elaborate ritual, he is no longer himself. In the process of putting on the sanctified mask made under magical situations, he is inwardly and internally transformed into the deity which the mask represents. His friends and neighbors may recognize him even with the mask, but they must give no indication of this, because while he wears the mask, he is not himself. He is the God. The uh, power of the mask is also expressed to the people. These people are perfectly well aware that the dancers that come out of the dust storms on the old mesas are not really physically gods. Yet they are welcomed as gods, referred to as gods, because they wear the god mask. They are not masked men. They are deities. For while they wear these sanctified regalias, they are transformed by a mystery into the spiritual power for which these masks stand. Now, how are we going to explain this in the terms of our common everyday life? We can't probably actually explain it. We can talk about it psychologically and mystically, 
Or we can take the attitude of the average tourist who goes into the area, that they are a very superstitious lot of rather childish people who will believe almost anything. To a measure, perhaps, such a negative attitude can be sustained rationally and logically, yet it is part of religious mystery, and it isn't limited by any means to these humble people living along the sides of the Rio Grande River. This uh, mystery extends throughout the world. We find identical mystery rituals with identical meanings in Tibet. We find that when the priests take on the various vestments, particularly if this uh, process is accompanied by certain secret religious formulas, these priests are then so transformed that the deities become temporarily embodied in them. Now we know that in the areas around which our modern religious life developed, this kind of concept was also quite dominant. We know that the Egyptians, by means of masks and by means of various sanctified images, held it to be a religious truth that divine powers could be brought to bear upon the rituals and rites of their ceremonies, that in the masked priests the proximity of the deities was assured. The Greeks had a similar belief, using masks religiously and sharing with many other peoples the belief in the sanctification of images. Now, the, uh, the old idea about the sacred image is again a form of the concept of transubstantiation. A certain image of a deity um, made by an obviously earthy artist composed of physical substances, marble, wood, stone, plaster, whatever it might be, this image, by certain rituals, by certain rites and ceremonies, was caused to receive into itself, as the Greeks said, the presence of a blessed being. That in some way, by ritual and ceremony, a transcendent life power was focused through uh, this physical image. All of those who accepted this realized that the image was of transitory material, that it could be broken with a rock or an axe. Yet this in no way detracted from the mystery with which the image or the substance uh, was enveloped. Likewise also throughout antiquity, it was assumed that magical power could be caused to uh, descend and associate itself with various familiar and common objects. If these familiar and common objects were subjected to certain rituals and various processes of purification, ceremonies, invocations, prayers, and the like, always, however, the sacred object had to be consecrated in some way. And once having been so consecrated, it possessed a peculiar and wonderful virtue. And this virtue uh, caused it to be worthy of certain veneration or adoration. The Greeks tell us clearly that they did not believe uh, that Zeus himself was captured within the great statue uh, fashioned in the name and likeness of Zeus and now called the Olympian Zeus, so one of the wonders of the uh, artistic world of antiquity. They did not believe that the deity actually inhabited the statue. They did not believe that the deity was bound to the temple where that statue stood. They did not believe that this statue was the proper person of the deity but they believed that this statue was in some way 
associated to or connected by some subtle energy with the power of the deity, that you might say it was ensouled by a ray or an extension or a quality of the god which it was fashioned to represent. We find uh, even among very early Jewish law uh, similar ideas, and certainly it abounded in the ceremonial magic of early and medieval Jewish Kabbalism. The older Greeks and some of the wiser of the Egyptians, such as Iamblichus of his mysteries of the Egyptians and Chaldeans, attempts to explain logically uh, the story of the relationship or the sympathetic ties between an image and a divine power. Paracelsus also gave quite a consideration of this subject in his study of sympathetic medicines uh, for the healing of sickness. According to the more rational intelligent of the Greeks, uh, there is a law of similarities or similitudes by means of which things of like nature cannot be completely separated from each other. And whereas things of dissimilar nature cannot be brought together, that which is like is like that which it is like, possessing the same quality, power, or energy. If, therefore, a magnificent image of a deity was fashioned by a great artist, it was assumed that the beauty, the sublimity, the nobility of this image in some way was a similitude to the God himself, and that as a result of that, some part, some extension, some vibratory overtone of the divine nature was captured in this noble and sublime likeness fashioned by men. That in a sense great beauty, great dignity are cups into which divine powers are poured. And that nothing that is truly noble or truly great can be completely separated from that which is most noble and most great, namely God. Now there is another way in which we can also uh, think about this problem, and uh, out of centuries of consideration and not a little controversy in the church, St. Thomas Aquinas more or less summarizes uh, the final attitude which was to prevail concerning transubstantiation, especially uh, at the ceremony of the Eucharist. His opinion was that this transubstantiation actually, factually, and literally took place only if the person in whose presence it was performed, or for whose benefit it was performed, was in himself a noble, enlightened, and spiritual person. Therefore, at the time of the Eucharistic transformation, or alchemical uh, mystery of the Mass. For those who were profane, for the unbeliever or the unpurified, there was no real or visible change. But for the person who had the inward consciousness, the miracle was performed. Therefore, it might or might not appear or be visible to the beholder or the observer, but it was known in the heart. It was an experience within consciousness itself. Thus we seem to find the entire situation finally thrown back upon the believer. We seem to find that the concept finally becomes that an object is sacred if the believer, in purity and sincerity, so accepts it to be sacred that this object is worthy of veneration if it is experienced in the heart of the believer that it is worthy of veneration, and that deity is present in the various rituals, rites, and ceremonies of the Mass if this is believed, if this is held to be a certainty of conscience.
Under these conditions, we see that we are very much back again to the general philosophic structure of man's religious belief. A philosophic structure which is based not upon what occurs around man, but the interpretation which man himself places upon this or these occurrences. If, therefore, the person looking out into the world beholds in the seeking nature with its infinite diversity of manifestation and is thereby content to say, I live in a natural world and to go about the daily problems of his day. But if this person by some experience within himself experiences the transformation of the world, so that by some mystical reverie or illumination he gazes out upon the same environment and suddenly discovers it to be alive with divine power, suddenly sees nature transmuted and transformed into the radiant presence of the universal deity itself, then in that moment the transubstantiation has taken place. It is the individual through his own experience who experience these changes, who suddenly recognizes the various levels to which he can become aware, and at the same time his neighbor may see no difference. Yet his neighbor denying that there is a difference may also be wrong, for this difference occurs within consciousness rather than within the substances of things. Yet, as uh, some of the uh, uh, fathers of the uh, Council of Trent pointed out, uh, that which is seen by this internal experience may be regarded as more true, more real, and more valid than the objection raised by the one who does not see, who insists that nothing has occurred. Uh, here we come very close, of course, to our Oriental religion. We come very close to Taoism and to the experience of old Lao Tzu himself, who suddenly penetrating through the form of things discovered the universe to be a great divine motion, an, in, an eternal movement full of life, and was no longer locked within the comparatively restricted dimension of the commonplace in which we live. Therefore, we have one explanation to all religious ceremonies, an explanation that can be applied to the Greek mysteries, the Egyptian mysteries, the rites and ceremonies of ancient America, or the rites of the Brahmins, Hindus, in general, Chinese, uh, the Japanese, Koreans, and all other ancient and distant peoples. Thus, the actual mystery of the transformation of things by religious insight falls into the grand pattern of mystical experience or illumination itself. This is one explanation which, to the devout person, overcomes certain common objections. And these common objections did arise during the early history of the Church. Uh, it was observed definitely that in the uh, transubstantiation at the time of the Eucharist, no visible change occurred either to the bread, the wine, or the water. Nothing seemed to change. Yet by some mysterious power, this uh, ritual had wrought a difference. And there, was only, there were only two ways that you could explain this difference. Either that it was actual or that it was symbolical. And needless to say, the symbolical school had quite a bit to, to contribute also down through the centuries in their reflections about the matter. The uh, symbolic school has always held all ritualism to be symbolic of some form of transformation which is to occur within the life, the body, the soul, or the spirit of man himself. 
if the symbol is a similitude or a likeness, a visible allegory, a visible legend or fable, by means of which something itself innately beyond description uh, can be figured or set forth in some way that can be conceived or apprehended by the average person. According to this point of view, the mystery of transubstantiation is actually a story of regeneration. The transformation of the uh, elements of the Eucharist represents the transformation of the mental, emotional, physical, mystical parts of man. The actual transformation may also imply that by the presence of God all flesh and blood may be transformed, including the flesh and blood of the believer. And that whereas the uh, person who believes in the mystical experience may assume that the Eucharistic rite is the actual taking into oneself of the blood and body of Christ, the other group will affirm that it is symbolical of the fact that all life is sustained by the blood and body of God, and that therefore every ritual of life is a Eucharistic ceremony. That whenever we breathe, we breathe in God. Whenever we take food, we take of the life of God in living things. Therefore, that all life lives upon life, and that there is only one life upon which it can live, and that is the eternal and divine life, which is the source, cause, and sustenance of all things. Religion, therefore, comes as a dawning awareness of the sublime fact involved, a sudden recognition of duty, responsibility, and all that is implied by the fact that man lives from the bounty and from the very spirit and body of the universal creator. The symbolists then develop this line of thought, that these rituals had about them some double meaning, uh, something by which uh, the outer life might be made more solemn, more splendid, uh, more enlightened, but at the same time there was an intimation of a mystery in man himself, which had to be accomplished by the regeneration of his own nature. All of these elements combine in, a, in establishing the point of view, uh, which has always uh, been the essential core of Christian belief. In Christian faith, it may be said that the Mass anciently constituted the very substance of the religion. And the Mass itself was merely a complex of songs, of rituals, and of ceremonies, in the midst of which uh, was enshrined the, the Eucharistic ceremony, the ceremony of the transformation of the bread and wine according to the last Passover of Jesus prior to the crucifixion. Thus the Eucharist itself comes from what is called and generally referred to as the Last Supper. And from this also, it was only a step to the recognition or celebration of the Lord's Supper. As time went on, uh, the original pattern uh, was uh, more or less extended. And the first extensions of the idea are properly attributed to various commentaries given by St. Paul in referring to the actual Last Supper of Jesus. It is Paul who first intimates or arcanely uh, points out that this Last Supper was more than a holy feast, more than something to be remembered uh, lovingly uh, by the disciples, something more than the touching story of a teacher knowing that he was going to face death, having this final farewell union with his disciples.
uh, the Paul points out that there is more to this, that this represents a central point around which was to be built the concept or the idea of the Eucharistic rite, that a part of Christian worship should be the continuing repetition of this rite by the faithful, that the, uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper should constitute a peculiar and wonderful remembering, a continuing of the solemn and sacred occasion uh, which it originally uh, described. So we have in St. Paul uh, the moving spirit of the transformation of the historical story or the legend of the Last Supper into its inclusion as the central theme of the mass of Christendom. Here again we see only another aspect of St. Paul's essential belief in the Christology concept. Paul was not satisfied to think of Jesus as a, a teacher of the Jews, was not, was not satisfied to regard him as an enlightened rabbi or reformer of the temple, nor was he willing to include him among the prophets and the elders who had uh, gone before in the history of the ancient Jewish nation. To St. Paul, there was a uniqueness about the entire story of Jesus. And it was this uniqueness which caused him to unfold a series of parallels or a series of analogies by means of which the story of Christ becomes no longer the story of a man living in Syria 2,000 years ago, but a continuing eternal mystery in the spirit, a mystery infinitely reproducing itself age after age, a mystery which by certain rites and sacraments continues to be enforced, to relive its own existence, to extend its power throughout the entire extent of the survival of Christendom itself. So Paul began to emphasize this problem of the Lord's Supper. It is quite possible that without Paul, for a little time, the disciples, had they been able to gather, might have continued to celebrate this occasion of the Passover with certain sad memories of the one in which they had parted from their teacher. But now it became part of the basic belief of the Christian communion itself. And it was customary and natural, probably originally only at the time of the Passover, for the Christian community to repeat as a sacred rite this peculiar and particular uh, incident. Now, we do not know, and frankly, I cannot find any record in either the Greek or Latin fathers, and according to the best information obtainable, no such record exists, just exactly how the early form of the Mass began to develop. I think, however, that we have to realize three or four different things and take them in a reasonably proper context. First of all, the structure of the Mass probably is not essentially Christian. It is probably pre-Christian. It is derived from other sources inasmuch as nearly all religious rites and ceremonies stem from previous beliefs and doctrines. It is quite possible and quite obvious that some part of this ritual could have developed from the simple Jewish feast of the Passover itself, and from the early beliefs of peoples of this area of the consecration of bread, of the setting aside and the blessing of food for the nutriment of man and even of beast. Later, uh, St. Francis of Assisi blessed the food of the cattle, 
And uh, there is much evidence that in very early times, the blessing of the harvest, the blessing of the field, included the thought or the admonition to remember that in some way this food was a symbol or a carrier of divine life, that food was sacred, that the breaking of bread was also a sacred symbol of the bond of friendship. And the, uh, this included later the use of salt. Uh, that actually, wherever the individual uh, shared in the family food, sat down at table with the family, whether he be a stranger or a friend, there was a certain fraternity established, that there was a brotherhood of bread, and that those who broke bread were bound together by a strange and significant relationship. To eat another man's bread was to acknowledge a friendship, uh, was to become in certain sense an ally of that man. It may not have been as strong as blood brotherhood, but even in the problem of blood brotherhood, we find that the mingling of blood and the shedding of blood was an ancient tie, and a great deal of this information can be further developed from a study of Frazier's encyclopedic work, The Golden Bow, which has to do with most of these primitive rituals of mankind. But that there was, at the time under consideration, a sanctification of food, uh, that to break bread was symbolic and mystical and that prayers offered in the orthodox communities of the pre-Christian period included the sanctifying of bread and the setting aside of certain parts of it as an offering to God. And we have the story of the unleavened bread used in the Jewish ceremony, a story which does descend considerably into our Christian account so that the various rituals of other people might and probably did affect uh, the gradual concept of the Holy Supper, inasmuch as the Holy Supper was a sitting together in search of God, uh, the preparation of the meal in which the unseen guest was the honored presence in the midst of the mysterious banquet of the wise. Uh, Plato describes the banquet of Olympodorus, which was a philosophic banquet in which it was not food, but understanding and uh, the graces of the spirit which nourished and fed those who assembled together in search of truth. So I don't think we can doubt that the Eucharistic ceremony could be traced we know that the Dionysian rites of the Greeks uh, included the belief that the body of Dionysius was transformed into wine. Therefore, that the use of wine in a religious ceremony, the presence of the mysterious cup which that represented Dionysus, and finally the mysterious monogram IHS, which has also been carried into Christianity, which was originally the monogram of Dionysus. That therefore the body of the God was said to have entered into wine, a wine of ecstasy, and those who were lifted into some kind of a religious trance by this wine were said to be under the control or to be ensouled by the God. But the use of the of the of wine was anciently part of a ritual. Will be also remembered from the meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek, at which time a mysterious feast of wine, corn, and oil was part of a sacrament at a very early period in Jewish history. So that these elements undoubtedly could have resulted in the gradual integration of a concept.
The second point that probably has to be taken into consideration is the gradual change which took place in the structure of the Lord's Supper. Needless to say, in the first centuries of the church, where the brethren met under the most difficult circumstances, in caves, in cellars, in the catacombs under cities, in isolated places, or even if they were not persecuted at all, in most humble chapels, sheds, and houses in the desert, perhaps little better than adobe huts. It is quite certain that in these times, uh, anything that we realize or recognize in the great and grand description of the Mass could not have existed. There seems to be no doubt, therefore, that in the beginning, the Mass was exactly uh, the same as in its original performance by Jesus. It was a simple gathering of the brethren. There were divisions within the structure of the early Christian community, and it is quite probable that postulants and those who had not passed beyond a certain degree of acceptance were not permitted to partake of this holy supper. Therefore, it was undoubtedly a symbol of full membership, a full acceptance into uh, the Christian religious communion. It is also quite certain that in these early days, uh, priests as we know them did not exist, that many of these ceremonies undoubtedly were performed without the benefit of any religious officer of any kind. Uh, perhaps one of the group itself being appointed uh, to lead or celebrate this rite. In this way, it undoubtedly lingered for quite a while. And around it, in its precarious and difficult existence, was the gradually fading structure of the ancient pagan world. And around the years of the rise of Christianity, uh, the great Egyptian rites uh, were failing, but they were still visibly performed under the Ptolemies, and were still powerful, particularly the rites of Serapis, Osiris, and Isis in North Africa, especially the area around Alexandria. Also, we know that the ceremonies of the Alexandrian Serapis, Isis, Osiris triad was not regarded unfavorably by the early Christian church growing up in its midst. In fact, when certain important Christian bishops visited Alexandria, uh, they first gave their religious services to the community of Christians and then went and performed a similar service in the temple of Serapis. Thus, uh, the early bishops apparently celebrated whatever the rituals of the early church were, both in the Christian community and in the pagan community, uh, recognizing no essential difference. This is hard to understand, perhaps, but we must realize that at that time the differences in beliefs were perhaps even harder to understand. There was a great similarity in the visualization and concept uh, of Serapis and Jesus. Serapis was the weeping god of Alexandria. He was represented as a tall, noble figure, bearded and with hair falling on his shoulders, and in his face an expression of inconceivable sadness. He was called the weeping deity. And he stood solemn and alone in the midst of the great Serapium of Alexandria. His sad God, with his noble brow, with his false beard, with his almost effeminate face, and his long flowing hair hanging in ringlets on his shoulders, was not very different from the first concept of the appearance of Jesus. The principles for which the Lapis stood were also very similar to the Christian principles. But the Lapis was a deity of intercession. He was a deity forever weeping over the sadness and wickedness of the world. 
As Jesus wept over Jerusalem, Serapis wept over Alexandria. And it was also Serapis who was forever begging the evil-minded and those of corrupt nature to mend their ways and restore themselves to the kingdom of blessedness. So it's not entirely inconceivable that the priests of these two faiths should have much in common in a time when neither group, perhaps, had any clear sense of division or demarcation uh, between religious rituals. I think we must assume that in the first century especially, whereas most of the Christian converts were from non-Christian movements and non-Christian beliefs, where the small Christian community was rising in the late splendor of the magnificent rituals and dramas of Elysus, where the great rites of Greece were still being performed, where the tremendous ceremonialism of Rome still flourished, although perhaps without too much essential meaning, where everywhere throughout the known world the old temples still stood, the old sanctuaries were still served by their gods, where lights blazed on a thousand non-Christian altars. It is not impossible that the uh, development of a ritualism could have been, if not intentionally, at least strongly subjectively impelled uh, by the existing and prevailing pattern. Well, I have discussed this problem with a number of different important persons, particularly religious leaders in the Mediterranean and Mesopotamian areas, and they all, although Christian men themselves, they are all convinced that much of this ritualism of the early church was certainly derived from non-Christian sources, and that therefore we have something upon which to build our understanding of the gradual submergence of the older rituals into the Christian rites and also perhaps a little clearer insight as to how the early church was able to take the place of so many of these earlier ceremonies. Wherever we find records of the earliest missionaries, and that is in the first two or three centuries, going forth into other parts of the world to convert the unbelievers, in these times we do not generally find the tremendous religious differences arising that mark, say, the 6th to 12th century. Many of these missionaries and travelers were received kindly and friendly by non-Christian people, were permitted to perform their religious rites without interference by the local religious beliefs. A good example of that, of course, is the story of St. Joseph of Arimathea, having gone to England, according to the legend, was enabled to build his first little wattle church on the Isle of Avalon, and there uh, to practice his faith in the presence of the Druids, who apparently made no effort to interfere with him. In fact, may have assumed, as many did, that he was merely another branch of their own belief. This continued uh, until a considerably later date, when the rise of a more clear-cut orthodoxy forced the Christian church into a dynamic opposition to other beliefs. But in the early days, this opposition did not exist. In fact, we find most of the anti-Nicene fathers actually apologetic, more inclined to take the attitude that actually Christianity was nothing more nor less than an improvement of beliefs already existing, and that it made no claims other than those uh, which uh, had already been advanced by other faiths. This, uh, therefore, may give us a second clue to the rise of the ritualism which we now know as the rituals of the Mass. The Mass, almost certainly, was built upon a series of foundations. The greatest expression, probably, of religious ritualistic symbolism in the world today is Pontifical High Mass of St. Peter's. And here has been gathered together so many diverse elements of ritualism that we are practically compelled to recognize 
throughout the various segments of this composite pattern, uh, evidence of many religions that have been strangely woven into one tapestry of uh, procedure. Uh, there is uh, much borrowing from many places. But this in itself is a perhaps no very great importance because every religion, even doctrinally, is indebted to others. There cannot be any other relationship or pattern in religious life. Now the third factor that we may observe is that having adequate material available, in other words, living in the suburbs of the great pagan splendor of their time, uh, the Christians had all that was necessary uh, to provide the machinery, uh, the technical structure, the precedent, and even for that matter, the very mechanics of an elaborate religious ceremony. As Christendom began to increase in, the, in temporal importance, particularly after the councils of Nicaea had resulted in the recognition of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, it became perhaps rather obvious that a, a very major change was taking place in the religious atmosphere of the time. At this stage, the older rituals and rites were gradually falling. Far partly they fell because of the Roman attitude. Rome becoming master of the world became a very highly materialistic culture in which there was little consideration for essential values. Uh, various Roman emperors, particularly the more corrupt ones, uh, hated and feared religious influence, did everything they possibly could to discourage it. Gradually also, Christianity locked with the pagan institution in an elaborate conspiracy, and uh, the various groups fought for existence under one of the most savage types of secret warfare a warfare centered around theological disputes. In any event, it is very obvious that as Christianity increased in temporal power, it was almost inevitable that it should also make use of the machinery that had preceded it, and finally to develop a highly dramatic, highly spectacular, and highly impressive uh, religious ritual structure. So as its temporal power increased, its rituals became more impressive, involving greater displays of worldly ostentation, greater displays of wealth, greater evidences of temporal power. Now, as we study the history of the papacy, for example, we find uh, that it was really a very strange kind of structure because here we have the gradual developing of a great power, a power both spiritual and temporal, a power in which uh, the influence for the direction and domination of the mind of Europe rested largely in the power of the church. Yet here was the church itself, um, attempting to hold in line, particularly religiously, a group of extremely ambitious battle princes. Europe was uh, moving gradually into its most intensive period of feudalism. Here we had robber barons in their castles on the tops of mountains. Here we had a circle of ambitious uh, princes slowly carving out the boundaries of what were to be the states and later the countries of Europe. Here we find despots, dictators, tyrants, and assorted uh, whatnot, all struggling for physical authority. All of them seeking to rule Europe and, for that matter, to extend their rulership 
to the circumference of the known world. Here also during this same period, a rising conflict with Asia was developing. The Muslim was increasing in influence and authority. It was a little too soon for the Crusades, but they were in the making. And in the midst of probably the most hopeless pandemonium that is possible to conceive, stood the Church. The Church attempting not only uh, to maintain itself, but to hold its authority and expand this authority over the entire domain of feudalism. The Church at this time had no standing army and no temporal power whatever in, in a physical or literal sense of the word. Almost any of the robber barons could have gone to Rome, sacked the Vatican, and destroyed the Church. Uh, the Church formed alliances with one rising power and another, always try trying to keep a few uh, political friends to fight its battles for it. Very often the Church chose its friends unwisely and they were defeated and the Church was left again like Cardinal Wolsey, bare and naked unto its enemies. But here it was, this mysterious thing, seated in malaria-ridden Rome, where the, many of the popes reigned less than a month. Here it was, in the midst of this great, rising political conspiracy of Europe. It was unarmed and gradually increasing in wealth, it had its own princes and its own uh, leaders and no domain, actually, except what was later to be carved into a small area called the Papal State. It had inherited the toga of the Caesars, but only after the Caesars had lost everything they had. It became and uh, uh, carried the titles the titles that Caesar had carried. The Pope became the Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge builder. But he hadn't a piece of timber to his name to build anything with. It was really a rather complicated situation because the Church at that time was a totally intangible entity, trying desperately to maneuver its own survival and, of course, to advance its own end uh, in a world that really cared nothing for it, uh, perhaps was a little jealous of it, and ever ready to sack it at a moment's notice. Under these conditions, the Church had only certain weapons uh, which it could use, and it used them wisely and unwisely. It used some of them very wisely from the standpoint of its own preservation, and it used some of them, such especially as its indulgences, very unwisely, because they in turn resulted in the uh, great break or rift, which was to the result in the Protestant Reformation. The Church had only certain ways of achieving. First, all of the, these states, principalities, and so forth, which were out slugging each other to death on the fields of battle, the glorious fields of war, all these states were nominally Christian. Uh, nominally was really an overstatement. Uh, they were uh, destitute of practically any visible indication of Christian grace or charity, but uh, the uh, robber barons, knights, and princes had their chapels, they had their bishops, and they uh, made certain um, perfunctory uh, allegiances to the church. The only thing the church had to rule with at that time was fear. Fear of anathema. Fear of excommunication. And this alone kept many of these uh, feuding night from simply turning upon the church and destroying it. Its next uh, possible advantage was 
its ritual. Uh, the, uh, the complete confusing of the materially minded person by the extravagances of a great ecclesiastical uh, sacerdotalism, a tremendous ritualistic pageantry. High mass in some great cathedral brought many a dictator to his knees. There was something uh, that was impossible to fight, something that seemed to be so vast, so intangible, so mystical, so magical, so filled with a kind of strange, transcendent sorcery, that the rather superstitious, if brave and stubborn-minded uh, nobles, finally fell before the intangible influence of the Church. To maintain this intangible influence, the uh, church was much in the same position as the Rajas of India. When the people get a, got a little unhappy in old days, the Rajas had a durbar, brought out all their best elephants, put on their finest robes, wore their greatest jewelry, and paraded up and down the main street of their city. Everyone then was deeply impressed and went back and lived happily ever after. And this was more or less what the church had to do in order to survive. It is certain that uh, this survival was at the expense of a great many basic values. It was certain that in this period of time the church could only establish a vast glamour. It had to glitter more brilliantly than anybody else to conceal the fact that it did not have even one regiment of soldiers to defend it. The only way it could be defended was to get the Poles to defend it, the French to defend it, the Germans to defend it, or the Italians to defend it. It couldn't defend itself. And about the time the Poles were ready to defend it, the Austrians decided they didn't like the Poles and the Church was in trouble again. Uh, the uh, final emergence of all this was uh, the establishment of a great spiritual over government, a government of intangibles, a government that had its own priests and princes, a government which in order to advance its own purposes uh, made children cardinals and made laymen popes, bringing them in and consecrating them as priests and popes the same day. These things were emergency measures and it must be admitted that in the building up of this tremendous bulwark against feudalism, uh, the Church surrendered a very great part of its spiritual integrity. There's no doubt of it. But if you had lived in the year 752 and had been confronted with one of these problems, with the light and the mind and the understanding and the lack of understanding that was general in those times, uh, probably uh, you would have had to win either by opportunism or seen everything you stood for disappear. So the church did not intend to disappear. It never had that intention. And it did everything that it could to survive. But in order to survive, it gradually expanded its ritualism. It elaborated its processes. It reached a point where it exercised so vast a psychological effect that men such as Richelieu, who was a cardinal, but was never truly a religious man. He was a duke, yet he carried the cardinal's power, and he could bring the king of France to his knees. This power was all the strange power of magic, power of ritual, the power of a great intangible, built solidly upon the prevailing religion of the time in the area, and building the empire of this world upon an almost invisible point in space. And really nothing more or less uh, for a world, a country, and a land than the high altar of St. Peter. This, I think, gives us the real and practical...
think, however, that there is a thing in the world today, certainly, no group in which ritualism has become so highly complicated as in Roman Christianity. In most other countries, ritualism has retained a certain simplicity. Now, one answer to this may be that most other countries have not had the wealth or the physical means to sustain uh, so tremendous um, a program. Also, in most other countries, uh, religions have not been uh, so completely um, dominant as they are here. Uh, they have nearly always had certain divisions uh, uh, within their own structure. Uh, for example, take in China, where three religions uh, share a certain degree of uh, equality. Therefore, there is no complete dominance of one, or one that is able to control the, the economic resources of the entire country. While there have been some state religions, most of these state religions have not been like the Western ones. And here we have something that perhaps is worth another passing moment of thought. And that is, what is the essential reason why uh, Western relig uh, ritualism has become so complicated and uh, Eastern has not? Most of the Eastern nations have had similar emergencies as those that influenced the West. Perhaps the answer is very definitely in the psychology of the people. The East in general, and the whole Eastern Hemisphere, is strangely introverted. The East has always thought of religion primarily as something internal. Uh, the religious growth in Asia has always been a growth inward from the circumference of the personality to some root within it. Whereas in the West, whether the Greek or Roman, Egyptian or Assyrian empires are involved, always progress, growth has been an externalizing. Uh, the, the West has always uh, brought things out of itself into its environment and has created great forms. Even as the uh, king became the builder of cities, so it seems as a Western man has always been building exterior to himself. He has surrounded himself with greatness, whereas Eastern man has mysteriously always sort of thought of the virtue, the dignity, the serenity, the sublimity of simplicity. He has had a little different attitude, and I think we can observe it in the fact uh, that Eastern religions have, for the most part, with the possible exception of Islam, never had the political ambitions uh, that have dominated Western religious groups. So as a result of that, in your Asiatic religion, you find ritual. But because this ritual has never been completely involved in a vast pageantry, which has extended it from a comparatively simple thing into so involved a process that uh, a complete study of the mass and mastery of its technique will require ten years of work. Uh, the other peoples of the world haven't done this. And so perhaps in some of these other simpler groups, uh, you can find that which is almost totally submerged in the mass. You can find, perhaps, the essential principle of the symbolism, uh, separated from its extremely uh, numerous and glittering encrustations that have assembled and gathered around it over the period of centuries. In all religious ritual, whether it be East or West, what is the essential purpose for a sacrament or for a rite such as the Mass. We speak of Buddhist Masses. They are also given. We also know that certain elements of the Mass, not complete, but fragments of it, particularly the Eucharist, have survived in the Protestant denomination. So that uh, even in Christianity, certain elements of ritual are for the most part uh, perpetuated 
in a very modified form by a number of Protestant groups. The essential purpose of the, of the religious ritual in most of the uh, Eastern nations has been an extension of the concept of individual prayer. In other words, ritual is a gathering of a, of a people for the purpose of glorifying God. It is a collective, congregational kind of worship. Now in most per per places, although not in all, worship is divided into two distinct sections. One is a worship by means of a hierarchy of priests, and the other is private worship. Therefore, in the Orient also, you find the same situation prevail. In most Hindu, Buddhist, Shinto temples, priests are available. Priests perform certain rites and certain rituals and have certain daily observances that are peculiar to their own obligations through ordination. In other words, a priest or a monk of almost any of these religious groups is required by his obligations to perform certain pious ceremonies which are not required of a layman. Thus there is more activity in a religious house among its priests than there are among the laity. A second point in connection with this is that on certain days there are public ceremonies performed essentially by the clergy, but witnessed by the non-clergy. These public ceremonies consist of celebrations relating to sacred days associated with the life of the founder of the religion, or to certain universal astronomical or cosmological dates which have gradually been involved in the theology. This common practice is in both East and West. The various rituals and ceremonies differ slightly with the different sects, for these rites and ceremonies were inaugurated by the founders of sects rather than by the founder of the religion itself. In Buddhism in Japan, we have 12 or 15 sects of importance, each of which has minor differences of ritual. All are essentially dedicated to the same principles, but each has distinguished a way of worship that varies slightly from others. And in this way, uh, these ways of worship have particular meaning to members of that group and are less meaningful to non-members. In the development of the Mass in Christendom, at least nine different patterns developed. These patterns, however, have gradually divided themselves into the, non and Ro non the uh, Roman and non-Roman Catholic Church, churches, and the non-Roman including the Greek and a number of other Near Eastern groups, some of the, also the Copts in North Africa. But these different rituals are performed primarily in honor of or in testimony of gratitude to, or in beseechment of, the power of the divine being represented. Now, uh, how, would you, how would you say, for example, that the Buddhistic, uh, which might be a parallel to Christianity in many respects, how would the problem of the Mass, for the Buddhist have a Mass, uh, relate, for instance, to the common symbolism that we know in the Christian Church. In the Buddhist temples, there may or may not be images of the Buddha, Bodhisattvas, Arhat, saints, and sages. If they are there, uh, they are enshrined or altered very much as in the case of the Western Church. Uh, there may be smaller rooms, chapels to various deities such as Kuan Yin or Seishi or one of the other Bodhisattvas, and there may be a great central icon or image or painting either of a single divinity or of a triad. Persons coming in to the presence of this image or group of images 
usually make some genuflection as a symbol of uh, humility or as greeting. In most Buddhist countries, the greeting used is exactly the same as used for another human being. There is not too much essential difference. There are not elaborate uh, rituals relating uh, to the recognition of a deity in a church or temple and the recognition of a friend by salutation. The presence of the image is intended for only one purpose, and I think this is true essentially in Christianity also. It is merely a symbol of a principle. It is a, a, center, a central symbol sanctifying that place, indicating that it is a sanctuary, that it is not a house of business or of entertainment, but that it is a place of worship. And in the uh, presence of the image, which is usually in a central or altar position, uh, the individual is acknowledging not the image, but the concept, principle, or energy for which that image stands. This recognition may consist either of prayer, or of meditation, or of intercession, the, the pleading that the deity will be of help in some emergency. It may be merely uh, a ceremonial occasion, as with certain festivals, in which the gathering is merely to honor the deity, or it may be a supplication for help in some great emergency or difficulty. Uh, even, however, where it appears uh, that uh, the image is the central element in the design, I think it is the same as in the uh, Christian church, that the image, the crucifix, or whatever may be present, is merely the emblem of a conviction. And at the end, this emblem of conviction is used as a means of focusing or centralizing the attention of the individual. Now, if you go into uh, one of the uh, old literary works dealing with these problems in the Orient, you come upon a very interesting thing. Long ago in Japan, the great Fujiwara princes lived in a very wonderful world. It must have been a world of great art, great beauty, uh, and great uh, serenity. The natural love of beauty of these older people and the peculiarly sensitive appreciation they had for law and order made uh, their world a very charming one. At that time, the Fujiwara princes were converts to the doctrine of the Amida are the doctrine of the interse intercession of the Amida Buddha for the redemption of mankind. This perhaps is that phase of Buddhism nearest to Christianity in its essential meaning. So in this uh, period, what did the Fujiwara princes do? Uh, they really believed that it would be possible to prepare a world here so beautiful and so wonderful or that actually they could fashion Amida's Western Paradise right in the wonderful isles of the island of Japan. So they built magnificent temples based upon the ancient paintings and pictures and upon the stories of the old sutras of Buddhism. They filled these temples with marvelous statuary. Uh, they trained priests and temple dancers, musicians, so that, and so that these temples became in their glory something utterly beyond description. It was really as though they had floated down from the sky. And in this very wonderful, if somewhat decadent atmosphere, these people actually attempted uh, to create a world as beautiful, as filled with peace, as gentle and as forever thoughtful as the mysterious world of Amida that was supposed uh, to be far beyond the western sea of life. Now in this I think perhaps we have the secret of a good many things. Uh, these Fujiwara princes 
in creating their rituals based upon the sacred text of the Mahayana Sutra, uh, developed a, a wonderful unworldly pattern, the purpose of which was to lift the human consciousness out of the everyday and give that consciousness an immediate, if only transitory, experience of eternity. In other words, this whole pattern is to cause a tremendous psychological experience within the individual. But in the course of their great rituals, these Fujiwara princes, therefore, fill their wonderful palaces with lights and flambeaux, uh, fill them with song and beauty, fill the gardens with flowers and birds, and, and created this wonderful kind of world in the midst of which were the processions of yellow-robed priests chanting the ancient hymns of the law. They really felt as though in those rituals they were, picking, they were picked up out of this world and taken into another kind of a realm. And in this other realm, they've also experienced a great consolation of spirit. They sensed that heaven was near. They were aware eternally of the presence of beauty, that it was only a short distance from this world to the other, and that this world also uh, could shine with the radiance of that larger universe. Thus, in a sense, all of the temples represented miniatures of a larger and better world. Each sanctuary was its own little vaulted heaven. Each one of these sacred places was a place into which man retired out of worldliness, into the beauty and sublimity of his faith. And the rituals and rites, therefore, seem to carry the individual into this great world over which the gilded Amitabha uh, ruled forever among the radiant flowers and jewel lakes of his celestial palace. The idea was, therefore, that in a mysterious way, even here, while you still live, you can experience something of the world of God that lies beyond the visible. I think this instinct was present in all ancient religious beliefs. This instinct to try to create somewhere in the world something that had to do with the other world, something that was not just a palace for a king, but to a measure at least was a doorway to a world of greater mystical value. It was only this mysterious contact or sense of contact with infinity that probably could hold barbarians in check and could bring Darius to his knees. There, is, uh, there was something that uh, was unworldly about it all. And I think that in a sense, as we uh, study the mass or study some great uh, mystical uh, interpretation of the mass such as we find in Wagner's Parsifal, there seems to be no doubt in the world that in the celebration of mass in a great cathedral, the experience of hierarchy is very strongly intended. In other words, the individual is lifted up by a mystical experience into some kind of a sense of a spiritual world. The great cathedral with its wonderful windows and its vaulted arches is just not of this world. And although it may be a monument to centuries of human labor, when lighted only with flickering candles, and uh, here surrounded by all the habiliments of a great faith, the solemnity of the mass, mass is, is uh, exhibited. It is something that uh, becomes a kind of immediate mystical visual experience. It is the building up of faith through the eyes. It is the strengthening of some kind of an inner belief through exhibiting to that belief the pomp and circumstance of a great 
Hodges. After all, to the medieval Christian, God was king. God was not to what the, what the mystic thinks of God. God was really a great spiritual monarch, ruling over a sublime and supreme court in heaven, more glorious than the courts of any kings of earth. God was an absolute despot. God was served by a mysterious hierarchy of angels and archangels and cherubim, and on earth by a strange hierarchy of dedicated persons, and his vice regent upon earth was the Pope of Rome. Thus a great sense of medieval imperialism was sent. But this was the way of the life of that time. This and this alone could bring these people to their knees. This alone could cause that peculiar psychological experience by which man forgets to ask reasonable questions and becomes completely overwhelmed by the mysterious testimony of his own senses. Great music, great art, the strange rhythm of the mass, the weird cries of the period, all of these things are out of man's common experience. They represent something that psychologically touches his inner construction. And by this inward touching brings him into some kind of immediate experience of the importance of the religious equation in life. Now this importance may be falsely evaluated, this importance may be steeped in numerous superstitious doctrines, but this importance still becomes a, a guide to a way of life. And for millions of persons, this importance, this guide to a way of life, has led to uh, a certain adjustment with existence that has resulted in a life of faith that was very strong, a life of sincerity that was very deep, and a life far away from the conspiracies by which the very situation itself was engendered. So out of this whole problem, there certainly seems uh, to come to our attention uh, that these factors help to set some kind of a belief in the souls of men. When you take all art and all music, all beauty and all solemnity away from the religion, I don't think you can deny the fact that you impoverish this religion in some way. You ask of man something that normally he cannot give. Namely, you ask him to carry completely himself the full burden of his religious life. You try to tell him that religion is tremendously important, but that he must discover this only through some experience within his own consciousness. You throw everything upon the individual. Now, actually and ultimately, this probably is the proper end of things, that the individual must carry it. He must work out his own salvation. He must achieve virtue through his own inner integrity. But it is very, very difficult to make this work in common practice. It is like saying to a person on another level entirely, there is no need for you to go to school. If you will study, eight hours a day, from the time you're seven till the time you're twenty-five, at home by yourself, you can learn just as much, and there are schools that will credit you for this work. But who's going to do it? Who is going to self-discipline himself sufficiently to devote this time, to make this effort for the sake of becoming educated? It's almost impossible to expect this to be done by the average human being. Only in company with others of similar efforts, only when he moves with his age group, only when he shares in certain minor competitive instincts with his classmates, can you keep him in line with a long-range educational program. He will not do it by himself. 
It is the same way with religion. It is very hard for the individual uh, to achieve a spiritual state without some form of religious symbolism to support him. This can be excessive and unnecessary, but that some part of it is, is present seems to be a natural necessity for man. He needs the periodic experience of sincerity. He needs the strength of some form of religious symbolism. He needs it through art or through music or through something. He needs some religious study to integrate his effort. And unless there is some pattern by which he can uh, develop his spiritual resources, he is not inclined to do so. Therefore, I do believe, after watching the whole situation pretty carefully for a great many years, that there is some need in, in modern religion for a greater expression of emotional warmth, a greater release of the instinct to beauty, rather than uh, a sort of square-toed Puritanism which has gradually come to dominate our concept of religious life. Our religious life in the West has for the most part, with the exception of the various uh, Catholic churches, has lost most of its emotional warmth. It's lost its art. It's lost its music. It's lost its magnificence in the sense most necessary to the experience of man. I'm not talking of hierarchy. I'm talking of the simple impact of religious value upon the consciousness of the person. Now, it is perfectly true that the individual can go out into nature and come into the most beautiful cathedral that was ever created if he has the insight. And the mystic has the insight. The mystic does not need ritualism. But how many actual mystics do we have? How many people find their religious life strong enough by their own mystical convictions alone to enable them to live the principles that they believe. I think in the modern time we are having a difficulty, which is one of the difficulties that the church faced nearly 1800 years ago. We are concerned gravely today with, for example, the lack of religion among young people. This doesn't apply to all young people, but there is an increasing number uh, who apparently are falling away from religious conviction, and this increasing number is also falling into various types of juvenile delinquency at an alarming rate. I do not believe that we would have half of our uh, burglaries and 60% of our auto thefts in the United States committed by juniors if these young people had any deep reverence for value, uh, had any deep appreciation of something more important than doing exactly as they jolly well please. I don't believe that if these people, these young people, had grown up with a vision of the nobility of religion in their souls, that they could so quickly have forgotten it. Nor do I think that the majority of these young people are in a condition to accurately form their own religion. I don't think they can go unaided into the maze of modern theologies and find what they need. I think they must recognize some pattern, some value structure by which they are given a, a situation which gives their respect in which they come to respect and honor value. Now, the great value of life is that which is honored in quietude, recognized in meditation, experienced in devotion. It is something that, like the old palaces of the Fujiwara emperors, it is something built in this world to stand to the glory of the eternal. Now, I don't think that this needs to be uh, a, a, 
sacerdotal structure as it was before the building of the pyramid. I don't think it needs to be sectarian or creedal. But I do believe there should be something in our lives to remind us that we live in a universe of truth, a universe of principle, and that the greatest joy, the greatest good in this whole world comes to those who are able to truly love that which is truly worthwhile. And we've lost it. We've lost it almost completely. In our rebellion against indulgences and perversions, we have lost also this something by means of which we come to an inward symbolic experience of the divine world around us and in us. We don't have to be creedal and sectarian about any part of this, because actually this universal temple, uh, which is the divine nature of things, is available to us through our own hearts. It is available to us uh, through our own quietudes and through our own meditation. But I do think that it is, it is rather good that uh, something in the form of an adequate sanctuary to rise in the midst of nations, not something to our creed and to the battle of our sex, but something that stands forever for the principle of good, a value unchanging in a changing world, that somewhere we should have that tie with heaven, that binding to the sky, by means of which we are not lost forever in the shadow and gloom of our own mistakes. I think this was what ancient people tried to do. I think it was that they, they believed that if you had periodic contact with that which is sublime, that you would be a better person. You might not understand everything, but perhaps even out of this not understanding, you gain the strength that even understanding cannot bestow. What was needed, what was wanted, was that man should realize that he lived in a world that was bigger than business bigger than the physical things that he was concerned with, bigger than the ambition to preach it, bigger than the tyrannies of the time. A world which also guided him in his values, a world in which he was prepared to meet the changes of life, prepared to come and prepared to go, that he had to live with faith and die with faith. Somewhere along the line, we lost this. And I think this has been the greatest cross that Christendom has ever had to bear, is that it gradually lost so much of its faith and found in its place only too much fear. Fear has been the, the most destructive element in the entire development of Christianity. This fear which tried to make men good only finally turned them from the faith. This idea that uh, somewhere, some way, some terrible destiny awaited us unless we were good orthodox members of something actually ruined our faith. It took it apart. It destroyed its value for us. Because in this very experience of fear, we lost our primary love and respect for truth. How could we truly love and truly fear our God at the same time. Instead of being the, develop, the devout father, the wonderful parent, God gradually became the difficult and distinct stepfather, the tyrant. And out of this fear, which undoubtedly was a machinery of preservation at an old time, came gradually the law of most of our religious convictions. We have probably turned from religion more due to fear than to any other single cause. I don't mean necessarily that we were all afraid, but I mean that the idea of fear in a faith destroyed our own faith in that faith. That the human heart in its own natural instinct does not 
naturally fear. The human heart does not fear to live nor fear to die. It has to be educated into fear. Its own natural instinct is faith. It does not want to be lifted up into a sublime experience one moment and cast downward into the concept of purgatory the next. So by degrees this inconsistency arouse the bitterness of science, arouse the animosity of the intellectual, gradually brought criticism after criticism upon the whole structure of theology, until finally, to escape the fear, we gave up the faith. Uh, this is more or less the story of modern man who is now struggling desperately to regain his sense of orientation. In your mass, in your great experience of the mass, you certainly do sense the splendors of a divine court. You sense some power or some authority beyond our own. You partake of a ritual that goes back thousands of years. You are moved out of this display by the most primitive and ancient instincts within yourself. But when you come out of this into fear, uh, something of precious value is utterly destroyed. So some way we have to get a universe in which we can have this heaven without the corresponding hell. And we are told that in all the mental and moral polarities of life you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have a concept of eternal good without some vision of eternal ill. This, I believe, is a false belief, but we still have it. The answer lies in the direct inward realization of reality itself. For if, instead of clinging to beliefs by which men divide each other, and all religions have to some measure this problem, we come rather into the sense of reality. If out of the sublimity of religious experience we arise finally uh, to the realization that there is an eternal fact and that for this fact there is no shadowed error. That in the universe itself being is not polarized. There is not light and darkness in the state of the human soul. There is reality. And men have turned it light and darkness. So that out of all of this we have the possibility of discovering a universe of infinite justice, infinite truth, infinite wisdom, and infinite love. And at the same time, there is nothing in this universe to fear. If we can, if we can gain more understanding of that, I think we will gain a great deal. Now, locked within the very essence and heart of the entire mystery of the mass is the Eucharistic life in which the mystery of the transformation of the bread and the wine uh, into the very living nature, body, substance, and essence of Christ. Uh, this mystery is said to be achieved. I think that underneath this entire mystery, we could find the answer if we also read a little further, perhaps, in the Gospel of Paul, the Gospel of Paul. Here we find his clear and distinct statement that the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Therefore, the transubstantiation of the host occurs in you. That this outer is a reminder, is a magical or mystical rite which perhaps could contribute a little something to the realization. Even as your mandala diagrams in uh, Shingon Buddhism, by their own arrangements, create within you a certain receptivity to universal law and order. The transubstantiation, therefore, is, uh, in fact and substance, as Paul tells us, is that instant of realization in which all things become new. This is the mystical experience of Plotinus. 
This is the moment in which man glimpses the infinite facts of things. And in this infinite fact, all things which are material, represented by the bread and the wine, become transformed. And we perceive that their materiality is only of an appearance, and that all things are substantially spiritual. And that this realization of the substantial spiritual universe in which we exist also opens to our psychic or inner life the great mystery of our true nutrition. For if it is true that man's body is supported by the bread of this world, so it is true also that his spirit is supported by the bread of righteousness. And as it is true that he may drink of the water of this world and thirst again, he may also drink of the water of eternal life and thirst no more. Thus there is this eternal nutrition, and there is a physical or formal nutrition. Aquinas tries to tell us that the body must have its bread, and it must have its nutrition but that by the very chemistry of assimilation and digestion, the transubstantiation occurs in the very process of the digestion of food. A great mystery occurs in man when, in the service of life, the bread which he takes into his body is transformed into the life energy which must sustain him. Thus the human body is continually performing a strange and mysterious Eucharistic rite. And from this alone, ancient people seem to have gained a wonderful sense of value or a sense of authority for their own belief. But if we can assume that in the absolute uh, apex of the Eucharistic ritual, that the concept is that in that moment, man through the inward enlightenment of his own nature, by an instant of extraordinary devotion, of extraordinary integrity, of complete sincerity, of total self-forgetfulness in the experience of the divine, is in that moment he is able to suddenly feel or know within himself the transformation of his own consciousness. In that moment, he attains the true mystery of the Eucharist. In that moment, all things that happen are again happening or occurring in the terms of a great messianic principle, as Paul told us. For if Christ be lifted up in you, then all else that is necessary shall be, come, shall be accomplished. This lifting up of Christ in you is the elevation of the host. It is this exhilaration experience. And by Christ, we know that the early church represented or signified the universal love of God, the same principle of infinite salvation that is intrinsic in every grain of sand and every atom of space. Therefore, the spirit of the true Savior is the actual presence in man of the power of his own salvation. So if this can be brought into focus in a dynamic experience, although this experience may last only a few seconds, it constitutes the miracle of faith fulfilled. It constitutes the establishment of the experience of spiritual certainty. It accomplishes that moment of identification with that which is eternal and inevitable. So that in the midst of this mysterious ritual, there is supposed to be a strange and mystic separation of the sheep from the goat. And though and the ecclesia or the temple itself is the sheepfold, and it is here also that the ritual was performed, in which at a certain point the profane were ordered to depart, and only those who were purified and prepared were permitted 
to assemble for the final and uh, greatest uh, part of the sacrament. Then, when the profane had departed, the uh, purpose of the final ritual was to create this mood, this created sense of the presence of God, with the conviction that if this mood was strengthened by whatever outward means were available, whether it was the simplest gathering of devout persons or the most magnificent uh, clustering of the glories of a great mass, whatever it was, if it caused the individual to suddenly be united with his brethren and with his God, he in this one moment of experience achieved the two commandments of Jesus. For if he in this instant let recognize that he and his fellow members of the congregation were united as one being in Christ, and at the same time uh, he, the priest, the bishop, the hierarchy, were also all united in one substance in God, that in this sense, immediate sense of identity was perhaps as well expressed as any other the entire concept of the mystical experience. For the mystical experience in Christendom consists of these two factors which have to be simultaneously and identically experienced, namely the infinite fatherhood of God and the eternal brotherhood of man. These must both take part in the experience itself. In Christendom, the experience is not an experience of wisdom alone, nor is it an experience totally of an, an apotheistic state of being lifted up into a kind of ecstasy of God. In the mystical experience in connection with the Christian mass, the end is twofold and clearly indicated. First, that the individual shall feel himself to be one with the congregation, that the congregation is now one being, and that this congregation, now one being, is the church. It isn't the building with the towers and the bells and the walls. It isn't the long cloistered corridors with the stations of the cross. It isn't the altars and the side altars. It isn't the nave and the crypt below. The church, or the ecclesia, is the assembly of those who have experienced the identity of life, the complete and absolute sense of brotherhood in Christ. At the same time, experiencing that this brotherhood, all of it, exists within the vaster and greater fatherhood of deity. So to experience the immediacy of union with the Father, and at the same time to reach out to the immediate experience of absolute kinship with our brethren. These two constitute one experience. They are the same experience as mentioned in the, uh, by the Arhats of Buddhism or by the mystics of the Vedanta. It is two ways of expressing the one truth, and that is the final achievement of illumination by the experience of the unity of all existent life. And that this unity of existent life includes all creatures existing with us, or visible or unseen by us. Also, that it includes our relationship with that one eternal source of life. Uh, which, with which we are also bound in the same mystical relationship. This is also symbolically set forth in certain phases of the mass. And this, these phases, of course, include the prayers for the dead. They include prayers to and for the saints, for the visible and the invisible, for those here and those hereafter, for those not born and those who have passed on and for those souls in transition, waiting purification. The prayer signifies the union of consciousness with all orders of life, mundane and supramundane. Thus, in a strange way, 
the entire ceremony summarizes a kind of mystical experience. Whether those who fashioned it knew this, we do not know. But those who passed through it under certain conditions experienced it, regardless as to whether it was intentionally placed there or merely represents the psychological culmination of man's spiritual quest over the ages. In any event, this is the way it adds up, and this is what it points to. And I think we must realize that this is the underlying structure of the uh, ritual and symbolism of the mass in Christianity. Well, I found it up, so I guess we'll have to